Well, today we're discussing ethics, right? Yeah. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. Did folks get a chance to do some of the uh, readings and videos? I looked through the fast AI stuff. That was um, that was pretty eye opening about uh, IMB. Sorry, uh, IBM. Um, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was a little bit shocking, wasn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, but it's like surprising uh, that we don't hear about that. Yeah, I mean, I knew all the other stuff about like you know biased algorithms and how you need to be careful with training and what can happen because you know obviously in a, a country like America where you got those historical issues and also a smaller population in different groups, it's going to cause biases. So that, that that's kind of like quite standard uh, in our area really to talk about those kind of things, isn't it? Whereas yeah. like the uh, the IBM thing was kind of like wow. Uh, hadn't thought of a system being used like that and also that system coming from a major corporate company at some point in yeah. time who probably didn't even know exactly well may not have known exactly what it was going to be used for maybe in the development sounds like in the deployment they understood what it was going to be used for mm. yeah that was a that was an interesting article like the the different like facets there's like seven facets like the justice the rights they had like some guiding questions too i wrote these down yeah i came up with some stuff to like share from that chapter um i was thinking i could share my screen and we could just kind of go through some of those points but i don't know how you all want to want to structure this because we have like basically three different resources right the, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about so we can start with the fast AI one and I can share my screen if, if you all want to yeah okay? let's just go with that mm -hmm. yeah all right um so I figure I just I don't have anything to present but I'll, I have some points I wanted to go over and I can share the chapter uh here can you see that uh mm -hmm. so yeah uh I felt like this quote when I was reading through was really uh uh, it's kind of in the middle, mm. but I felt like it was a good summary of like, I don't know, how AI is often perceived. So I'll just read it. We have entered the age of automation, overconfident yet underprepared. If we fail to make ethical, inclusive artificial intelligence, we risk losing gains in civil rights and gender equity under the guise of machine neutrality. And I thought this, that was really interesting here, the guise of machine neutrality. So like, I think that's kind of the, where the danger is opened up, right? When you assume mm -hmm. that 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 these are neutral and that it's just it's just math or whatever, um, and it, it's not opinionated, it's not uh, you know like a, I think how that's maybe how I think a lot of people outside of the AI world and maybe inside the AI world perceive AI, but um, but why it's such even more important, you know, to talk about this stuff. Um, um, Definitely. Um, yeah. Anyone else have anything on that point? Um, can you just see my? Uh, can you see my notes too, or can you just? Uh, or can you just see my browser? Just your browser. Okay. I guess that's what I wanted. All right. Um, okay. The second thing I want to just jump to, I think, would be good to as a discussion point. This, uh, or is it this diagram? that Steven, you also had in the, the chat. Um, I thought this was super interesting just because um, there's, uh, like I think people, a lot of people talk about the uh, data set part of it where you have, you know, you have an unbalanced or, um, or even uh, biased like relationships in the data. Um, but there's also a lot of other points in this process that bias can come into come into play, and I thought it was just a good a good job of showing all those different points of entry. Um, everything from how the data gets generated to who's represented, uh, how things are measured, um, aggregating out some important differences, evaluating in a way that that might uh, you know, lead to um, 
like whatever you're optimizing for, that thing that you're optimizing for could lead to uh, negative consequences, like the YouTube algorithm example mm. um, and uh, deployment. Yeah. So where you deploy to, who has access to it, et cetera. Uh, okay. I, I think, I think that's what, I think, I think that's what it means or integrate into a system, human interpretation. So like how people interpret that system and uh, use it, I guess. Um, yeah. So what do you all, uh, any other thoughts about this or as like a framework or what came up when you were reading this? It, I mean, this kind of connects to the other reading, but uh, the data feminism I got that on Audible and I was listening to it and representation bias, something interesting they brought up about, uh, it made me think of interaction terms, which was, they're talking about the topic of like intersectionality and how like they were looking at like hiring and how like being a certain race didn't necessarily affect it or being a certain gender didn't affect it, but being a certain race and a certain gender really affected it. So if you mm. didn't necessarily have that interaction term, you wouldn't find anything. And so like how important it is to. Um, yeah. And that kind of comes up here, represent. here too, in this example, right? Like in this, uh, this evaluation here, I mean, like there is an effective race, but it's not as big as this effective gender with race. Yeah. Um, in this case. So like there is an effective, if you compare male to male, but it's not as big as like this, this effect here. Um, yeah. So exactly. I think that's a good example of that, uh, the interaction. That would, that would fall under like uh, experimental bias or like the one before measurement bias, right? Like uh, representation Sorry. bias, right? Yeah. Or would it be evaluation bias? I, I need to read that example again, but I think it, I think it was because yeah, because there was like all those different kind of groups weren't included evenly in the data in the screening data. But I could be wrong. So if that's the case, yeah, I think it would be representation. But yeah. yes, as well, there's a lot of a lot of stuff around the historical biases in like with depend, depending on the example, but something about offering a mortgage or whatever. You know, yeah. if white men are more likely to keep their mortgage historically, and then you bias for that. It's kind of, you know, yes, you're being yeah. true to the data as you have it, but you are. That's a problem. Like, exactly. you can't just say, "Well, we're right. just following the data." Right. Yeah. I uh, one thing that came up for me when I was reading a lot of this um, for all the resources was this like idea of like just kind of trusting like the algorithm is going to find the best possible solution to the thing I'm trying to optimize for. And I'm just going to like, let it be. And that's going to be it, you know? And I, and for me, part of that, like ignorance or whatever comes from, uh, at least partially, I think like comes from the idea that like, like, I feel like a lack of theory actually sometimes might lead to that. Like if you don't have any, anything you're, you're expecting or like hypothesis or theory about like how you think it should work, and like you have no reason to like investigate it deeply to see if it's working that way, you know. Like, because mm. I feel like with some of these examples, if you just like looked at the outcomes along these different kind of groups and criteria, like you could pick up on some of these biases. And but like the question is like, do you have a re? Like, do people have a reason? Like, I and I, I know we all agree that they they should. You know, you should try to understand the biases in your data and your models, but like, but I'm trying to figure out like why might people not ask these questions in the first place? You know, um, I think yeah, that's really interesting. I think as well, there's especially more and more nowadays. You can you can trick yourself and think, well, I have loads of data. I've got hundreds of millions of rows or whatever, so surely it's fine. Like the bigness <laughs> makes it that it can't be biased, yeah. um, which is obviously a fallacy, but I think it's really easy mm -hmm. to do. Whereas in old stats terms, you'd care a lot about your smaller stat sample and all of that and really be allowing for, you know, actively thinking about these issues. Yeah, I think often too is like, Another factor that plays into how that can happen is 
the speed at which people want to develop and deploy models, they'll often, you know, opt for the most automated system, or if they like can't, they think they, they feel like they can't afford to hire like a data science team or people, they'll go for like some kind of uh, like pre-made automated solution and have somebody with just like a general programming background, like put it together for them. And, you know, the goal is just to get it deployed. And that would be a prime like circumstance where people would overlook uh, biases and like what kind of data is going in and whatnot, just because it's so focused on the end goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, it's really, those are all really good points. Um, something else that came up for me uh, um, in this is like, there was, I feel like a few examples where they said, oh, like we solve this problem by like not including gender or something in the, as a predictor. But uh, I think a lot of the time people also miss the idea that like there can be latent relationships between these variables that can introduce mm -hmm. bias like and like even with like something like um personally identifiable information like people are like oh yeah well if it doesn't include the person's name or like their social security number then like it's not identifiable but like in a lot of cases if you have like someone's zip code their age their gender and something else you can like identify people with a surprising amount of uh accuracy even though there's not explicitly that thing in the data set. And I think that's also important to consider is like, yeah. there's relationships that are there that you may not realize, like like something like a preference in terms of may actually represent gender just as well, even without having gender in the data set, you know, okay. um, uh, predictive and from a predictive standpoint. So I think that's also a thing that, I don't know if uh, maybe it didn't talk about as much as I thought in this chapter, but um, I thought it should, but yeah. And, and so the, the solution to that is that to, to have the variable is in have demographic data that you're actively trying to not be biased against, not include it, and then check that your model isn't doing different things for those variables you didn't include. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's like a cut and dry solution. Sure. I mean, I think like, I think like if you're conscious of it uh, and you like, yeah, I guess the answer is to like, have good techniques for understanding what your model is doing and then and then um so like not only looking at the outcomes and the bias and the outcomes and accuracy but also the the kind of mechanics but i guess a lot of the time that can be hard you know with a, especially like a deep learning type of model um, but you can yeah. use the uh, deep learning so i know people talk about like putting uh, things into or out of an algorithm but what you can do are um, you can do factor analysis or structural equational models in order to build up relationships between um, between the predictors that you're using, because you might be able to use those in order to help interpret what you're looking for. Like typically speaking, the biggest problem you're going to have in like a lot of models, like you know, risk analysis or you know, particularly insurance and stuff like that, is wealth. Uh, wealth is the biggest uh, uh, disparity between all different groups because it's also culturally relevant. So the amount of money that people have and also their location, and as you say, it creates, uh, tells you something. Now, I know in the US that there was a problem in, um, there's a problem that a particular algorithm wasn't giving insurance to black communities or something like that, but it was because it was associated with wealth. And the same thing happened with something to do with, um, to do with com uh, communication system as well. Again, it's the wealth factor that came into play in combination with the postcode, which is basically what you're saying, isn't it, Ken? Um, but so the point is, is that if you were wanting to investigate this, one of the best ways to do it might actually be to use something like a, um, latent variables or structural occasional modeling. And then you can see all well, these things are tying together, what does that tell us? Um, but I mean, it's only a starting point. It's a lot, the biggest problem you can have with a lot of this stuff. And I saw this in data feminism thing as well, which I didn't really agree with, not for any particular reason other than the fact of, as someone who works as a data scientist, you've only got so much time. And 
it's a lot of investigation to look into some of these things and to, you know, part of the reason why we have biases in the first place is because system, uh, schema and heuristics make thinking faster. And when you have to think fast and move quickly, you tend to, you will miss things um, and you won't go into as much depth as perhaps um, you would like, um, but that is something that is a bit of a business problem and it makes it quite difficult to challenge or to deal with these factors, it's not say so they shouldn't be challenged with, but rather that you have to cons you have to weigh up your time and costs. Yeah, I, th I think that's really interesting, and the a lot of the stuff that I think about or when when we look at these kind of issues, it's very difficult because you end up going right. This is structural. This is a problem that exists in society and is everywhere. And then it's kind of no one's responsibility to fix it. And yeah, if you're if you're being employed and you're being pushed with really tight deadlines and stuff, you know, it's very difficult to know where the limit, where the boundary is on like, is this my responsibility? You know, and can I consider it and say, you know, if we have time, we'll look at this. And, that, and I think those are all very, they, they're like hard real world questions that are very like situation specific, maybe. And I, uh, to add to that, I think, the problem is that if the data scientist doesn't do it, the business people won't do it because they just don't even see the bias. They, you know, you could, I mean, I'm going to be harsh here, but you could sell, sell them snake oil. They wouldn't see the difference. And, and now to be less harsh and based on arguments, I've, we did a review of um, AI used in um, recruitment, job recruitment recently for one of my assignments. And, reading business papers while reviewing AI use in recruitment, they clearly are not critical enough. So someone has to do it and it's not going to be businesses. Yeah, exactly. So it has to be the same. Um, so this discussion is really helpful to me because I'm at the point of collecting data, um, which is Twitter data for some kind of um, um, analysis. So I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm talking right now about um, representation bias. So for example, now I want to collect 10,000 tweets. Um, does that mean um, I need to collect like 5,000 female, 5,000 males so that I have equal representation? Would that be possible? Because I'm not sure. Um, uh, what, what do you think? What question, what question are you trying to answer? I guess is the, with the, yeah, with the so, tweets. Yeah, um, so many questions. Um, so when you have a tweet, there are many questions that you try to answer. So we want to do many um, machine learning tasks with the tweets. For instance, you can do sentiment analysis, you can do head speech detection, um, you can do many kind of classification. So um, I'm just curious now with this talk about representation bias, which is really, really something that needs to be taken into consideration while creating the data set. Um, I'm just seeing how um, we can do that. But this is a really good discussion to uh, be talking on. Um, thank you for that. Um, if anyone has a suggestion on what we can think of, um, please make an offer suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. I Well, the first thing that comes to mind, Sham, for me is like, what is it going to be used for? Like, what, the, what is the final outcome is, of this thing? Who's going to use it? And who's going to be affected by it? You know, and I think... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, so that might be a place to start. Yeah. Okay. There's always so. going to be trade-offs because like what Kevin was just saying is that most importantly, who's going to be affected? If this is something that's going to be mostly, you know, you're playing around, you're trying to get to learn technologies, that's one thing. But if this is something that's meant for production and to make inferences on, then... Um, there's always going to be trade-offs. There's not going to be a perfect solution. Um, and uh, yeah, because what, one thing that I was thinking about was also you might have sampling bias if you decide to go, you know, this way. Um, so there's, a, there's always going to be trade-offs from both routes or not both, from several, <laughs> several, several approaches. Yeah, and I think part of what you're saying, uh, Layla, too, is that like some of this, these, these topics here that were discussed in, um, sorry, there's some noise and I can't really, it's hard to hear. 
Um, that's better. Uh, so like these different approaches and like weighing which one you, I, I think the, the point for me also is like, you should just be like, you should be explicit about like what you're doing and like what approach you're taking and like, uh, and like your answers to these questions are like, oh, we're taking like, we're taking like a, 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 a common good approach or I, I don't know, but like, I think that's the first step, at least in my mind is like making it ex explicit and like out there for people to see. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what other people think. I think it was a really good question. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah I, I mean, think, sorry, Stephen. Go for it. Go, go for it, Luke. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I agree. In the yeah, having it as part of, I mean, it. Lots of you know different data science projects have different outputs, but having it, having it as part of the output, that's part of what you worked on and thought about and add, added somewhere visible, saying this is what we did. You know, if there if there is a concern about, you know, what what biases could be missed, or you know, if we had more time, we would have done this kind of including it as part of the final package. Cause I think that's, and that's part of the thing um, in one of the data feminism chapters, like all these processes happen, but then most people only see the final output and you kind of only think about that final output and not really any of the middle steps that could have issues within them. And it's not, it's not to say cancel the whole project, but just like to, to say that it's being it. thought about. Mm -hmm. Accountability yeah. is one of the biggest issues when it comes to ethics and AI is, uh, it, as you do more research in this, more reading in this space, is that a lot of uh, mishaps happen because um, or certain organizations do not hold themselves accountable for creating product that is um, uh that produces bad output, essentially, that harms people. And keeping yourself in check and holding yourself accountable is key because at the end of the day, research is still research, right? Um, at least from my, my point of view, because I work in, in an academic setting and, and there are always going to be people doing, evolving this, this science. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you're working in industry or not, you're still going to be doing some form of research to make sure that your own um, um, output is what you what you produce is in check. Yeah, I also think that part of part of the issue is like more of a like a, a values issue um, and a representation, not representation in terms of your data, but representation in terms of who's actually doing the analysis and who's making decisions about what's important. Um, because if you are looking at, you know, everything from a straight white male cisgendered lens, you are going to value different things than when you're from an ethnic minority, from a different kind of minority. And I think that is something that we don't talk about enough. Um, and something that I'm actually seeing uh, quite a lot in my research is that um, traditionally the field that I'm in is very focused on separating people into groups um, and you're not getting the kind of meaningful results that you're looking for um, because you're looking at com complex things and because of all these interaction things. So yeah, I, I think it's just, you know, it, it's important to think about what you value as a, obviously as a researcher, it's easier because you've got a little bit more autonomy, but also, you know, like, what do you, you know, think is important? Lots of words. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. The data, the data Feminism book talks about that as well, how, like, we are intrinsically biased to value certain things and be able to pick out certain things and be aware of certain things whenever we're working, doing anything. And having representation allows for possible points of harm or misuse to be pointed out. And um, a while back, my yoga teacher, I asked him, like, how do you know, like, what you're responsible for ethically? And he's like, if you're aware of it, you're responsible for it just plain and simple. Like if you, if you're aware of it, 
then your role is to like speak up about it or you know enlist support start discussion about it uh as early as possible like if you get people on board and make it clear that like this could be a potential issue that we can run that we might run into in the future then and you make that case well then people will generally be like yeah i think that's something that we need to plan for and work to like unbiased or like bring somebody in or like consult specific people that uh, are going to be affected by whatever we're doing to be able to move forward in a way that you know is not harmful and creates the outcomes that we would hope to create yeah so I think I share one good paper that I found um, by uh, one of the <laughs> by, uh, popular against such kind of data bias from Google, though she has left Google um, last month, I guess, uh, to me. December. So um, she wrote a paper called Data uh, Sheet for Data. Um, so, well, uh, for instance, the example uh, problem I'm trying to create to it, um, if I don't have equal representation of uh, maybe male and female. So I need to create for each data set, she um, uh, advocate that for each data set that is created, it must be accompanied by what is called data sheet, data, data sheet for data set. In that data sheet, we will explain like, okay, we have in our data, we have 10,000 data, but we have 20, um, we have uh, 2,000 female, we have 8,000 male. So we need to specify all that things included in the data set from the beginning of collection of the data set to the end of the collection of data. So each data set must be accompanied with um, data sheet. So it explains. So I think uh, maybe in the book uh, uh, for uh, the uh, first AI book, they also say that um, if you can explain what your constituent of the data is, then yeah, it's something that um, is quite good so that um, you already explain the bias in it and um, that may be somehow fine. You uh, explain what is the, uh, what the data set is. But that makes me, that reminds me, one of the things we concluded when we did our review on, you know, is AI make sure enough for recruitment is, um, so what strikes me all the time is that if there was more interdisciplinarity, there were there possibly would be less issues because I'm not saying we're perfect, but in social sciences we've been grappling for with some of those ethics issues for quite a while. And but because data science is doing things on their own, they just miss things, which they, there is already a lot of stuff happening in social science and they, there would be a lot to learn here. So if you have a social scientist friend, find you, or if you don't have one, find a friend who is a social scientist. That would be my conclusion. Social sciences or like in disparities <laughs> research. Yeah. Okay, so I thought I'd just pick up where, since Sham brought up Google. So I figured that would be a nice uh, transition into some of the points that I wanted to make. Um, when we first started uh, this cohort and we brought up ethics, um, I rem the first thing that came to my mind <clears throat> was the keynote from our CEDOCON from last year and where there were uh, two uh, Googlers that came by one, um, uh, can't remember their names at the moment, um, but uh, one is a fantastic uh, visualization um, in the visualization space. It's really excellent, and another is a um, AI researcher. Um, so they there's there's this organization within with within Google and then their AI research. It's called Pair People in AI Research, right? And they have a guidebook essentially um, that focuses on uh, human-centered AI. 
and they have a whole collection of publications and research articles that they've done, uh, that they've published, and tools, um, open source software that you can use um, to let me phrase my, my words right uh, correctly to make sure that uh, you as either a UX designer or a data scientist or um, even an ML engineer is like cognizant and aware of the effects that your models and your product can have on the public, right? So their talk was actually quite good. Um, but what I wanted to do was kind of talk about very briefly after it wasn't until after I started, after I, I went through it and then taking into consideration recent events that I was kind of like, okay, I, uh, I want to talk a little bit, I want to talk briefly on other, a couple other things aside from this particular talk. So I'm going to talk about this, um, their talk a little bit and the tools that they um, introduced. And then I want to talk about um, some of their points in a little bit. So the first thing they do is, um, is they talk about some of the, the things that you should be aware of. And the, and the main points were um, when you have, when you often run into issues, um, is most software, enge most engineers, not software engineers, but any kind of engineer often try to debug their code. They often think it's a problem in their code and not necessarily with their, their data. And so the first point that was made was that try and debug your data first. And they used a lot of visualization, really awesome visualization to illustrate how they're able to um, identify some of the problems in their data. Um, so what they did was they used the CIFAR 10, which is a very um, widely used, like the hello world of um, image recognition, image classification um, problems um, that's been human labeled into 10 different classes. So obviously like as you would, and, and I guess if for this particular group that they were talking to, I don't know, you know, this seems, it seemed very fairly obvious to me, play with your data first before you do stuff to it. So, um, but I guess to some engineers, that's not, um, that's not as common. That's not like the first thing, um, but, and excuse me, these are, my images are a little bit large. I took some um, capture of what, they move the um, meeting controls, okay, of what they visualized. And it started off with really just like um, all of the images together. Then they separated it by class. And you can see here that um, it makes sense. So airplanes are often took, the images are often take, taken from the sky. Um, mammals, like animals, are more like warm, neutral colored. Ships could be more in the water, etc. cetera. Um, oh, and, and this was something that they, that they commonly refer to as faceting. So if you facet, it, they facet it by the class. So when you do like plots, for example, you can facet by a, a feature. Um, and these are each, there's like, you can like zoom in and you can see each of the, the pictures themselves. Um, and then they also went in a step further to look at the confusion matrix to see how well their, um, their classification algorithm did. And you can see it does fairly well along the diagonal. Um, this is the truth versus the, um, the prediction. But what she wanted to really illustrate here is not focusing on how well it did, but focusing on the how what it did not pick up on and see where if that is something that is systemic or not. Sorry, my fault. No worries. So she filtered out all of the good predictions and then you're left with clusters of bad predictions. And so um, 
they picked up on one. Uh, I think it was the the biggest one of the biggest one is the mm. trying to differentiate between cat and dog, right? These are the biggest clusters here. And if you zoom in into one of them, some of them are just weird cats. Um, but for it knows, the algorithm knows that these are not cats. This one particular thing is not a cat. And yet it actually accurately predicted it as a frog, but it was labeled, human labeled as a cat. So like the point was here that this was obviously a human error. This was not a computer error. And so the computer did right in processing it um, and classifying it as not a cat, but be, be mindful of how, um, of your data and how, and the, your influence on it, essentially. The second point that they brought up was the trade-offs between fairness and ML. Um, and this goes back to the point, uh, some of the points that Kevin was making um, earlier. Um, and what they did here is they did a simulation on um, bank lending. And I don't know how many of you attended that or saw that talk, but that one I thought was uh, at a high level, like a it's a it's a good um, it's a good tool to play with to understand um, some of the trade-offs that are that have to get made, but it doesn't it obviously doesn't represent it's not truly representational of of everything of a lot of, a lot of metrics. Um, so in this simulation, there is a bank, they're pretending they're a bank and they're going to give out loans to people. And oftentimes you have, um, well, there's two groups. There's going to be, this is, this is unrealistic where you have a clean separation of people who are going to default on a loan and who is going to pay back the loan just based on one metric, which is their credit score. Oftentimes you're going to have overlapping categories where you have some kind of threshold and yet people still who you predicted would be would default on their loan actually do pay their loan back and vice versa um so they talk about some of the metrics that they used um and so here's the threshold they set it at 50 right down the middle and they use these visuals where they the dark colored ones are actually the ones that did pay back even though they were denied and then the ones that um, defaulted even though they were accepted for a loan. And the difference between the positive rate, which is all of the people that got loans versus the true positive rate, which is focusing on just the um, dark colored dots on this plot, which are the people who are actually um, paid back their loans, all the people actually did pay back their loans. So, um, now they, after explaining all of these things, they um, go, go into talking about classification and discrimination with something like this. Um, so they say the issue of how the correct decision is defined and with sensitivities to certain factors becomes particularly thorny when a statistic like a credit score ends up distributed, distributed differently between groups. So they now have added two different populations um, the blue population and the orange population. And you can probably see where this might get problematic because let's say they're a bank and they, they're out to get maximum profit. So they have different, um, in the simulation, different metrics from which to um, either give or um, reject uh, a loan. So if they strictly wanted to make the maximum amount of profit, this would be the threshold. So for the blue population, the threshold would be significantly higher than the orange population's threshold because they would make the most money. There are no constraints, but that means the two different populations are set to help at different standards, which is clearly problematic. Um, if you really wanted to be unaware of, the, of your populations, you would set both thresholds equally. So they set it at 55. Profit is not that great, but the certain groups have been given 
less profits overall. So the Orange Group has been given has been given less loans. But so they're at a disadvantage here. If you look at parity, where you say that you give amount that you give the same amount of loans to each group, which is really just focusing on the positivity rate, you still end up with a disadvantage group. You see that the loan threshold for the blue population is eight points higher than the threshold for the orange population. And then even if you go so far as to say, okay, well, let's, fo let's make the true positive rate, let's control for that and make those equal, you still get a little bit, um, a little bit better, but it's still not amazing. It's, it's almost as profitable. They leave a note here say, saying it's almost as profitable as demographic parity and about as many people get, get loans overall. Like they were kind of trying to say that this may be the best, but still in every category, there's a, there's a trade-off. There's like no perfect solution here. So, um, and that was just like a play dummy tool. There are a lot, a lot, a lot more metrics of quote unquote fairness. Um, and I think Kevin touched about, uh, upon that a little bit um, in his chapter, of, uh, in the chapter I covered. Um, but there is an actual tool that they have developed um, called the what if tool. And this is, uh, was developed to show that you can play with and this is the actual this is the basic iris data set the perfectly balanced data set and you can play around with your data and this has been made into an open source software that you can even embed into notebooks into tensorboard um things like that uh and it's it's visual so like if i click on a data point here um, this is one of the Iris Virginica, and you can see uh, length width uh, for the petals and for the uh, sepal length and width. And what it allows you to do is to observe the counterfactuals. And this is where you can like actually visualize what the nearest um, that the nearest point that was ac that was accurately predicted looks like. Um, and you can click on this and it's looking right now at um, the versicolor, uh, a point down here. Um, this is kind of hot for me. This example is a little bit difficult to, to kind of wrap my mind around because this is the iris data set, but um, I could see how this could be particularly useful when you're dealing with data points that, you know, like if you're looking at, uh, in the previous, like in the previous discussion, looking at uh, gender, right? Um, and you want to see something that's misclassified, what was misclassified versus what, what was, what was the difference? What was the delta between the two points, one that was actually classified correctly and one was that was not classified correctly and see how you can tune your parameters so that that is proper like the 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 wrong one is properly um classified so um let's see so that was just that's a, one tool that they talked about and then um the last bit that was um that was demonstrated is this uh embedded word embedding projection in like high dimension, high dimensional space. And it's using the word to VEC. Um, and this one is kind of cool because um, you can use, like you can search certain word for certain words along this giant uh, <laughs> blob of words. And you can make custom axes to see the relation between that word and um, other words that are near it. So like, these are these are talking about word embeddings, right? So like, and one of the biggest things that they looked at was if you looked at science and then you plotted science 
And then now I'm not like, this is just using PCA, but if you were to use custom and you put, um, I think they, I think they did, um, male and then female here. And then I think they just wanted to do it by, um, how do you see? Okay, anyways, I'm not like, I didn't spend so much time trying to learn this tool. Um, yeah, no, but I did take a screenshot. So this is what you get. <laughs> when you look up the word math um, and you can, uh, you, this is where you see that when you insert a, a giant corpa of text, a lot of times you get bias inserted with it. Um, and so here is the word that was searched and here are the axes. And th these also, um, this, this projection embed, like embedding projection tool often what they were talking about was in the papers that they um, have read and how this technology came about often found directionality uh, also uh, discovers some point, form of directionality. So you have man going this way and women going this way. And you see HTML, computation, physics, astronomy, astronomical, arithmetic, Women, psychology, knowledge, register, arts, procedural art, theater. So you can clearly see kind of like the associations with math and the directions uh, with men and women. Okay, that basically sums up that keynote <laughs> that keynote um, talk at RCU last year. But when I rewatched it and especially for this last one I was reminded of the more recent papers that have come out about large um, language models and this goes to what Sham was speaking of earlier with um, um, Timmy Timmy exactly and yeah, language models exactly How big they can be. her paper um is understanding the dangers of stochastic parrots. That was the one that got retracted. And I have some resources, but essentially, this is recorded, so I have some thoughts, so I'm not gonna share all of them, but um, there is a like a bridged version of that paper, Stanford and Stanford's Department of Research at AI, AI Research and AI Index, um, which is another organization, kind of um, did the same thing to a degree. It wasn't the same thing, but they wanted to, they published some works illustrating the same points that her team was going to um, push out. Because at the time when all this was going down, that paper was not found. You can't, you couldn't read the paper. Um, but now the paper is available and I actually included it um, down here. Sorry, I went too far. Um, the stochastic, the original paper that led her to being terminated, um, her and then subsequently um, about a month or two ago, a colleague of hers, um, there's some just really shady business happening right now at, at Google and their AI um, research Department of AI Research, and she's actually one of the uh, mo more prominent researchers in AI and research uh, ethics in AI. She she's really known for uh, facial recognition. Her research on facial I'm recognition. Biased. Yeah, exactly. So how like it their um, how their algorithms don't properly recognize. Uh, it's not really uh, great at at, at 
um, recognizing images and can actually be harmful in the way it recognizes images. So I just wanted to go over the um, some of the highlights of that paper and what the limitations that she actually was going to discuss. And I'm not going to go into my theories of why this it was retracted, but this is essentially some of the limitations and dangers of large language models that um, search engines like Google use, for example. One, they're very environmentally taxing. So the carbon footprint, here's the benchmark of like training large language models. Essentially, um, Google uses an algorithm called BERT. Training it one time is the equivalent of a round trip ticket to between New York and San Francisco. That's how much energy it requires. And that those models get trained multiple times, like several, several times. So one you can look down here, it says transformer of 213 million parameters with neural architectural search releases 200, uh, 626 pounds of, of CO2. Um, yeah, which is insane. Um, it, a lot of a lot of energy takes required is required to train these um, models, and then in addition to the inclusion of sexist and racist and otherwise abusive language, are going to make its way in this the training data because it's just so massive and vast that. There and the fact that there are not a lot of checks in place to balance this out, if that makes sense. So trained models are not going to notice some of the nuances of uh, language. So when things like they highlighted like the Me Too movement, right, or the Black Lives Matter movement, that came with a lot of um, language that was very racist, stereotypical. Um, bad language. So models are not going to pick up on nuances such as that. They're going to, it's going to ba basically get washed out. Um, also the smaller linguistic footprint. So countries like data from, from smaller countries where internet access is not widely available. How do you capture that? Again, that's, that, this is not something, those, those small nuances are going to get lost. And then at the end of the day, these models are just essentially way too large to audit. And when you have a model that cannot be audited, it's inherently very risky and can be very dangerous to certain groups. Um, and then last, well, second to lastly, there is a large opportunity cost with large language models. Essentially what she was, going, what she, what she was trying to say is that the, um, Essentially, you spend a lot of time doing uh, developing language models, but the models don't necessarily understand how language works. The language models are used to essentially uh, continue to be developed and developed as uh, because they're very profitable but actually understanding how language is used, it, not enough research is put in there and there's a large opportunity cost. So a lot of researchers don't even know, um, don't even have the time and resources to put towards understanding that, uh, that domain, going towards a research, research that focuses on how it actually works, um, which, could ultimately lead to better language models, but there's there's that trade-off, right? When you, um, with big corporations. Um, and then lastly, it's really easy to fool people with that much information. It's very easily, it's very easy to spread misinformation. Um, so yeah, um, aside from that, I, I had some recommended readings for any of you guys that were interested. Um, Something that I've read very recently is Algorithms of Repression. I actually got to speak to Dr. Safia Noble, um, who wrote this book, and she is fantastic. She's an information, she's a lab, she, she studies library sciences, but she wrote this um, 
book called Algorithms of Oppression that focuses on search engines and talks about concept of technological redlining and how they reinforce certain stereotypes uh, from advertising to results. And then currently, actually, I, I, um, I moderate a book club for a social, <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> I'm gonna put a plug for my own book club, uh, Social Justice uh, in Data Science. And I'm actually reading Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology. Um, and we're reading this book right now. Um, and she introduces something called uh, the new Jim Code and how race is actually used as a technology. And it's actually a really, really good read so far. Um, Did you just start it? Or I'm just wondering uh, if any of us wanted to join, how, how weird would it be to join now? Um, so we didn't just start it. We are halfway through, um, but it is, it is not a dense, a super dense read. Um, and one of the things that like, I actually just wanted to point out that the, about the carceral system in the United States, how the algorithm that is used, uh, it's called PredPol. This is how, uh, this is the algorithm that determines uh, where police should go do surveillance is actually based on uh, earthquake, um, It's, it's based on uh, earthquake aftershock algorithm. And I found that kind of funny, um, sad, but funny um, at the same time. So um, yeah, uh, I, I had to like, I had to let that sink in for a second that the algorithm for, for earthquake aftershock is what's used to uh, determine police surveillance. Um, and then actually I have two more. So this was going to be next in my book club was going to be automating inequality, this one. And then I recently just bought this book, um, for my own, um, understanding it's called white logic, white methods. And this is a series of essays, um, by two researchers, um, Tukufu Zuberi and Eduardo Bonilla Silva um, from UPenn and Duke. And it's a series of essays on methods um, that I've heard is really, really good. But this is more for my own uh, research and understanding. It, it's kind of dense. So that's it. <laughs> I'm sorry, it kind of, uh, I kind of went on, but um do you have like a link to your book club or any information is there like anything out there about it or? um so I had uh I think back in February I had like a google sheet sent out because I run Our Ladies Miami and so I kind of just sent it out through my community and through Twitter um to sign up um but if you're interested, I can send you information. Uh, we meet bi-weekly. Um, bi-weekly, is that right? Like twice a month, like every other week? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, every other week. Um, I, I think technically it means both every other week and also twice a, twice week, a week, depending on the context. But it's like one of those where, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, or not, it's not quite this, but I think of it every time, an auto antonym where like there's another definition of a word that's like the antonym of the other definition. But anyway, sorry. Uh, well, yeah, I, I never know which, which is the proper, what's the proper way to, to use that word. Yeah. <laughs> so and, I'm just and, saying, and, that Leila, I feel and hope for the best. Are you working on ethics? Leila, um, are you working on ethics? I know. So I, <laughs> I was really excited for this, actually for this topic this week because I don't know so much about ethics and I just wanted to learn more about it, um, especially since I uh, co-instruct a class and I don't want to encourage my students to just feel like they can plug in numbers into an algorithm and, you know, say they do machine learning, right? 
and uh, like actually be aware and cognizant of the actual effects that have on people. And, and this is just across disciplines, not just health. This is something that I make, not just with machine learning also, because like people often forget that they're at the other end of whatever you're building, there is there is an actual effect. There's the human. Um, people often see numbers. And so something I advocate a lot for, especially in health disparities research is where I kind of began um, and how your environment kind of affects the outcome, like your health, your health outcome. And a lot of that is structural, like systemic and structural racism is included into that. Um, anyways, so yeah, I don't study ethics. That's the, that's the long version of your, of your question, Shan. I just was very curious. <laughs> you, okay. You just love the topics. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would be interested in your next book, uh, just like to, from a, just uh, if, if it's possible to join that point, I would be interested in that. Yeah. 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 I highly recommend these books. Um, I, um, don't, uh, right now we, there's only about four people at the, at the current, at the current book club. So, um, that's what happens, but it's really just, uh, it's just fun to talk about and have these discussions. Um, and I'm trying to get her, I'm actually trying to get Dr. Benjamin to give a talk also just like Dr. Noble, um, because I, there's, I think one of the, the girls that are reading this in this, in this book club actually knows her from other, uh, other circles, not just this space, um, which would be freaking fantastic. Um, let me stop sharing the screen. I was going to say in college, uh, when I read the new Jim Crow, I like kind of changed like how I thought about a lot of things in the criminal justice system. And I was actually thinking about some of the takeaways from that book when we were reading these chapters. Um, so I definitely want to check out that, the, the book that you're reading right now too. Highly recommend. Yeah. That's, yeah, I'm reading the new Jim Crow too. That's one area where uh, like the justice system has been so resistant to empirical analysis at all of any kind i mean not to mention you know just biases everywhere <laughs> there's like no no metrics and accountability really in a lot of places it's kind of nuts yeah um i've also been following recently uh and um attended a few talks for from data for black lives uh is also I feel like they do really really good work um so I, like, another another place to look. It's the AI Justice yeah. League as well. They they have some awesome videos. Um, and there's a documentary. Um, some really also messed up stuff. Like the founder of the AI Justice Justice League was a research ML researcher, and her face recognition algorithm couldn't even detect her own face. It's really messed up. She actually had to put put a piece of like white paper over her face. Yeah. yeah. Data Feminism talks about that. Um, yeah. Did Luke have stuff he wanted to present from that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I kind of, Luke. Yeah, I spent too much time on mine too. I kind of lost track of time. Um, no worries. I, mean, I we think could he had to leave, leave, right? Or is he still here? Yeah, he had to leave. Yeah. I mean, we could start it off again next week so he can present on that. I think that would be good. I mean, if he puts stuff together, I don't want to just like sideline it because I've been listening to the book and it's really good. So we can start off again. I mean, ethics is a really big topic and I think it's under um, undercovered in a lot of instances. For and sure. so it's worth, it's worth doing another day. Because I mean, this was just like an overview and I feel like <laughs> it's just like a tiny like smidge of the iceberg in terms of like how, how much uh, needs to be known to really like work effectively in that. We didn't even really get to talk about um, awareness is like, a key step. Also, um, a lot of yeah. a lot of times you realize that the people behind a lot of the algorithms are not, you know, 
you know, evil people behind a computer wishing harm on people. They just don't know because they're, it, they're typically don't belong in the other class. It's, you know, white cisgender males developing these algorithms and it just doesn't cross their mind to think that, you know, um, one example that was made in this book is Google Maps, you know, is going to, was a user had a bad experience with Google Maps telling them to turn right onto Malcolm 10 Boulevard. Um, so because the X oh, was, man. yeah, the X was read as Malcolm 10 instead of Malcolm X. So as Roman numeral. So yeah, yeah. so that, that, that's just one example. And, and, and I'm pretty sure the, the, the engineer that developed that was not trying to be very, was trying to be malicious. It's just, unawares so yeah this was interesting thanks Layla and Kent and Kevin this was awesome yeah of course yeah, yeah thanks you guys this was an awesome discussion yeah. um just one random thing um this was this is not going to go in the um book down is it uh not unless you like submit it as a commit hmm. I kind of want to I'm, I'm a little inclined just so that other cohorts talk about it as well kind of like yeah it's there <laughs> um yeah I mean I'm sure John maybe ask John Tan would probably be open to it yeah honestly I really think like Julia and Max would probably be interested in just like making another chapter on it too. Just to plant a seed for it. For yeah. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So maybe I can put some, I can push some of the stuff that I had um, written or clean it up anyways and push it. And then Kevin, I don't know, whatever you want to do. Yeah, I have some notes I could probably add. Um, we just add to the same book down, like a, add a new chapter or something yeah we might want to like do y'all have y'all talked to john it's like at john the geek or do you want me to dm him if you could dm him and just see what he has to say about that that would be awesome uh okay like what he recommends in terms of where to put it um, right. okay book down. cool yeah I'll, I'll dm him and ask and see about like uh where to where to put those commits or where those to do those pull requests too yeah and then if you put it on there on our chat then i'll just uh, i'll put what i have there wherever, okay. wherever it says yeah. okay cool yeah i'll also mention in there that we can start again next week so luke can do his and that'll only speak good i'll be able to listen to a lot more of data feminism by then because i only really yeah. got half he's also leading chapter. next week's no on parsnip or is that sham uh I don't, Sorry, I don't who remember. is Luke? Um, who are we talking about? Yeah, Luke. I'm it's not sure. Sean. It's Sean. It's Sean. Okay. 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 And right. then Kevin is in Luke. Yeah, I, I flogged my name yesterday. Um, I Jams. said, let me do it. Let yeah. me try it. Nice. Instead of watching, let me try. Let me give it a try. <laughs> I have faith in you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? You're welcome. It. I said, I have faith in you. Really? <laughs> yes. Why not? All right. Let's see. I can do it. <laughs> you'll, you'll do great. Um, yeah, I have the week after. Yeah, I have the chapter eight. Uh, and then Luke. And then Sham again. <laughs> cool. Am I again? You're on, uh, you're on the chapter 10, on the second. Okay. And you're in the last chapter, too. All right. Just, you know, I don't know if you remember doing that. But, yeah. <laughs> I think I will change. I just put my name. Let me go and see what is there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm okay with that, but I don't know if you meant to do that. Yeah. Okay, let me check. Yeah. Yeah, somebody right, will pick okay. it up. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Great for discussion. Listening. Take care.